Praise the Lord, Destiny Christian Fellowship. You all ready to give God praise today? How many of you all excited about the freedom we have in Jesus? Hallelujah. There's no freedom like the freedom of a believer, right? John chapter 8, verse 36 says, Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Come on, put your hands together.
strong tower and the righteous run into that name and they are safe because we serve an everlasting God how many y'all know that from everlasting to everlasting he is God come on would you slip your hands up in the air all over the building and even online come on put some praise hands in in the chat if you know that he's God and he's given you the freedom yes to be and do all that he's called you to do we praise you for being our light and our salvation. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? Who shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? Who shall I I'm going to trust in the Lord. I will trust in you. Come on, let's sing that together. The Lord is. The Lord is my life and salvation. Who shall I be? Who shall I be afraid?
says that we can see the goodness of the Lord because he's good. We couldn't see his goodness. We couldn't see his greatness unless he was good. Hallelujah. That's why I want to sing God. He is so good. Do I have a witness that God he is so Sing that together. Say, God is so good. God is so good. good. God, God is so good. Oh, yes, he is. God, God, so good. He's so good. He's so good to
that you have prepared that you will send to meet every single need in this house on today. God, we declare and we decree that your word is established forever in our hearts, in our minds, in our spirits, in our souls. And we thank you in advance, God, for your manifested presence, for what you shall do, how you shall heal, how you shall deliver, and how you shall set free. And it is in the name of Jesus that we do pray and say thank you. Amen. Amen. And amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. We thank God for his goodness, and we certainly thank God for the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. Sometimes when I um, come up, it's, it's a little bit redundant because the um, minister of music has already taken my scripture and shared it with you, but it's worth saying again, found in John chapter 8 and verse 36. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you are free or shall be free indeed. We thank the Lord for his goodness. We thank the Lord for his mercy. We thank the Lord for his blessings. And as believers here in the United States of America, it is not just that we are celebrating Independence Day tomorrow, that we are no longer under British rule, but we are our own nation, but in Christ Jesus, we get to celebrate our freedom every day of the year. It's not just one day that we get to celebrate our freedom. We get to celebrate in Christ Jesus every day of the year that we are free, free from sin, free from bondage, free from the shackles, free from the chains, free from the shame of whatever we have gone through, come out of, free from whatever it is God has delivered us from, we can thank God and celebrate that every single day. And so I just encourage you this morning that you will be blessed of the Lord, that you will rejoice in your freedom. This is a little bit of leftovers. This is what we talked about in Women of Destiny yesterday. We had a powerful time celebrating our freedom as a liberated women, no longer under the bondage of sin. And in Christ Jesus, we thank him for the liberty, the joy, and the freedoms that we have. And it's important that we know the word of God. It says that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Sometimes, even as believers, we live under bondage because we are unfamiliar with the word. You don't have to be bound by that. You don't have to be bound by shame and grief and despair and sorrow. You don't have to be under the bondage of being broke all the time when you realize that you have a God who is your provider, that he will meet all of your needs, that he is a good shepherd. And he says in Psalms 23, I am your shepherd. You don't have to be in one. Everything that you need, I have. And if you have me, you have everything. So we've got to get familiar with the word. We've got to know what the word says. That is our declaration of independence. It's found in the word of Jesus Christ. So God bless you, beloved. Have a blessed and safe holiday weekend and rejoice in your liberty every day. God bless you. Amen. You left your glasses, baby. <laughs> all right. Glory to God. Good to see y'all. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. David said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. I can do it by myself, but it's better if you do it with me. Let us exalt his name together. We greet you in the strong name of our Lord. Good to be in worship. Good to see you who are here in person. I want to challenge more and more of you in the Bay Area, in Northern California. Every now and then again, come on and worship with us here in the sanctuary. I know you can do it online and you can experience God online. I get it. But fellowship, there's something about it. And the Hebrews does say, don't forsake the assembling 
of yourself when you can. And so every now and then I want to I want to challenge you who are just sitting comfortably at Bedside Baptist week after week after week. Lazy boy Lutheran leave week after week after week. Yes, so every now and then say, you know what, I'm going to put on my clothes. God was good to me all week long, and I want to put on my clothes, go to the house of the Lord, and see the saints, and greet them, whether you do it up close or far, that's yours, but there's nothing quite like the assembly, so I want to encourage you to do it. Just set your once a month, whatever, whatever it is, and just come on and join us. You who are in other parts of the country or the world and can't, literally, we get it, and we're glad to have you. Wherever you are, whether here in person or online, we greet you and thank you for being part of this worship experience. By the way, if you're a first or second time gatherer with us online, be sure to put in the chat, this is my first time, this is my second time, let us know who you are and where you are watching and worshiping from. Somebody in the chat will greet you on behalf of myself. My wife is on the chat, so I'm sure she will if no one else, but we'll make sure that all of our visitors feel at home. After the second time, we've claimed you, so you're just part of us. And by the way, if you need a church home, we now have membership not only literally here in the sanctuary, but uh, you can become an e-member and you can have access to what members have, counseling services and all the other things you have access to. We can do it virtually. So every Christian needs a church home, not just somewhere. Because, you know, some of y'all online, oh, I'm with Jakes this week. Oh, I'm with, I'm with Swindoll this week. Oh, I'm with, I felt like uh, uh, so-and-so. No, that's not, that's speakers. You need a pastor. You need a family. You need somebody who will be with you in Tough times as well as in good times. And so you can join us virtually. You can do that right online. You find out what membership is like. And as we say there, membership does have its privileges. So we want you to be part of that. Just the announcements, and I'll quickly move through the service because I want to preach. This is a full-length message, a two-broadcast week. So you all not getting none of that that 25-minute stuff today. Don't even try it. You're going to take your time uh, barbecuing tomorrow, so take your time in the Word today, all right? Just, just get over it. Oh, I hope it's another short one. No, it's not. All right, but let me get through the announcements first. This Wednesday, uh, the Young Adults Bible Study continues. My daughter, Alicia, uh, is teaching baptism after the water based on Luke 3. She will be finishing up her, her study topic, baptism after the water, and there'll be uh, gathering. So I, w- I want to let you know that we want to get you all involved, young adults. Get involved with the young adults. Grow together as millennials, Generation Z, whichever one you're repping. Be, jump in there and be part of it, and it will do you good. All right? So she's finishing up these gatherings this coming, um, this coming Wednesday. We want you to be involved. 7.30 is the time. You can come in person or you can join the band on the band app, all right? And uh, visit the website, pick up a flyer at the kiosk, you who are here, and you can also get connected to the band app. That way we give you all the info you need. There will be no worship night for for the young adults this month, so just giving you that heads up. As well. Now, this Saturday, brothers, 9 o'clock, MOD, I want to encourage all men, wherever you are in the world, join our men. We, dis- we get discipled together online via Zoom, and it is a serious uh, time of discipleship. So I want to encourage you, brothers, to get involved uh, wherever you are in the world. We meet 9 o'clock Pacific time, but wherever you are, just set Set your um, time zone appropriately and jump on Zoom. If you don't have the credentials already, just put it in the uh, contact us today. I'm a man who wants to join the men this Saturday, and we will get you the Zoom credentials so that you can join us 9 o'clock sharp this coming Saturday. And then, of course, I'm starting at 9.30. I'll open up the men's group and spend the first several minutes with them. Then once they go into life groups, uh, then I will go into the multi-purpose room and 
teach the first of three sessions entitled Following Jesus 201. And I want to help you understand what ministry is all about and that God didn't save you just to uh, let you sit on your blessed assurance. He saved you so that you could be active in the kingdom of God and get something done. All of us have ministry. I'm not the only minister. All of us are ministers if we're in Christ. And I want to show you that from the scriptures. I'm going to walk through in these three sessions all of the spiritual gifts mentioned in the Bible and make sure you know how to be conversant with them and you can discover the ones that are uh, your that are active in your life. Even if they're not active, but they're there latent, I want you to stir up the gift so that you can be used of God um, and make a difference in his name. So that's this coming Saturday. I want more and more of you who are taking the course locally, if you would come join me on these Saturday mornings from 9.30 to 11.30, that will give me a, a live audience so that I'm not just talking to the camera. Y'all know I don't like talking to the camera only. So come on, help a brother out. Just sit here and let me have somebody in the room to talk to. It's just two hours of your life, and it's, it's something you do for Christ. Only what we do for Christ will last. So, you know, you spend two hours shopping by accident. Come on and spend two hours on purpose in the house of God, all right? And give me an audience so we can uh, teach this course, all right? And then this isn't for this week. The following week is when we're going to memorialize Mother Judy Anthony, one of our members, uh, came to me years ago from the 23rd Avenue Church in Oakland, Church of God. And um, she came, she and her family came quite some time back and became part of the Destiny family. And uh, so Mother has gone to be with the Lord, and we want to memorialize her Friday after next, not this Friday, Friday after next. So I'll remind you again next Sunday, Lord willing. All right. Uh, I think that is it for the announcements, so let's give the Lord his tithes and offerings. Thank you, Destiny, for being so generous in your giving, and because of your generosity, we're able to do everything we're doing uh, to advance the kingdom locally, nationally, and globally. We really, really are making a difference because of your generosity. Our broadcast, Destined for Victory, uh, reaches people not only uh, anywhere where the internet is present, but li we literally have listeners on the continent of Asia, on the continent of Africa, on the continent of, of Europe, um, South America, and North America. So people are checking out Destiny's ministry, and you're helping to fund that. It's listener-supported, but uh, a, a percentage of that comes directly from our church um, and we want to, I, I tell folks, I want to be on the air even after I retire. Now, I'm planning to stay active uh, as a pastor for, for some years more if the Lord gives me those years. But even after I retire uh, or go to be with the Lord, I hope it's the former. I don't want to go too soon. Uh, but um, I want to, even after I'm no longer pastoring, I want us to have built such a library that people can listen to Destined for Victory for four, at least four years every day without hearing the same message. That's why I preach so long, because I'm building the library, trying to help you all understand. Uh, so, um, so that's the plan, because I want to be like J. Vernon McGee. Do you know he died in the 80s and he's still on the radio? died in the 80s, and for every five years, he takes his listeners through what he called the Bible bus, from Genesis to Revelation. He said, give me five years, I'll get you from Genesis to Revelation, and so that was his way. So I'm not preaching um, uh, Genesis to Revelation, but I want to have meaningful messages for at least four years, where Monday through Friday, you listen, and you don't hear the same thing until the next four-year cycle. Uh, we do four-year presidents. God knows we need the word every four years since we get presidents every four years. So I want to, that's the plan. So your giving is helping us to keep it on now so I can tell listeners uh, to help me begin. Eventually, I'm going to ask them to help me begin to build an endowment so that we can have money stashed away for years to come. Because you don't get to preach on radio because they like you. I trust and, and believe. 
there are stations that want me, but their fees don't want me. So that's why I'm not on there. On there. So just so you understand, when one of y'all uh, becomes the multimillionaire you're believing God for, uh, talk to a brother. All right. And, uh, <laughs> praise God. All right. Let's give the Lord his tithes and offerings. Let's stand together here in the sanctuary and um, join us on line. And we're going to take this time to meet and greet. If you want to give now, you can. Here in the sanctuary, we have tithing offering boxes throughout the, the room, as well as in the main lobby and in the children's lobby and in Barker Hall across from our sanctuary online. You know how we give. You've seen it, the graphic. But let's give the Lord his tithes and offerings and thank him for what he's given us. Father, we thank you, Lord, because our resources are not ours. They belong to you. And to that end, we give not grudgingly or of necessity. We give cheerfully because we know that's the kind of giver you love. Bless both gift and giver. Thank you that we're living under an open heaven because you promised that as we give our tithes and offerings, you would open the window of heaven, pour out a blessing we wouldn't even have room to receive. We know that means you're blessing us not only financially and materially, you're blessing us in ways money cannot buy. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Take some time online and chat your greet just like we're greeting here in the sanctuary and then we'll resume. All right, thank you. Please return to your seats here in the sanctuary. And we're going to commune at the end of the service. That will be our last act of worship before the benediction. And so if you are not yet prepared online, be sure to prepare yourself there at home by getting um, bread, cracker, whatever you have there that you're going to commune with as well as if you don't have grape juice, just find any fruit juice, whatever you have that you can commune with us and uh, be part of that important act. It's called an ordinance in many churches, but it is something we do because our Lord uh, set that example for us to follow. And so we will commune as we close this service. All right, grab your Bible, go with me to Ephesians chapter 4 again as we continue our study of this letter of the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus. Now, as I said at the beginning of the study, the first three chapters are primarily doctrinal with some practical application, and these last three chapters, 4, 5, and 6, are primarily practical with some doctrine, and today you will get a good mix of doctrinal truths as well as application. So this is quite the study message in the series. I'm not hooping. We're not going into E-flat. This isn't celebrating. This is learning something so you know how to celebrate later. 
All right, so just understand when I'm not hooping, it's intentional. I want some gravy with mine. This isn't a gravy meal. You just need to get some good old meat and good old vegetables of the word and uh, let yourself grow strong. Ephesians 4, beginning with verse 22, the apostle says this. I'm reading from the NIV, New International Version. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So I want to resume looking at just verse 22 as we were uh, looking at in the last message. And we were establishing the fact that putting off the old self is a crucial first step toward becoming new. If you don't understand that, if you haven't locked that in, I want you to jot it down if necessary Putting off the old self is the crucial first step toward becoming new. You can't become new until you get rid of some old stuff that God says, I don't have a plan to keep that in your life. Thank you for putting it on the screen. I want everybody to understand putting off the old self is the crucial first step toward becoming new. We've all got some stuff we got to let go of. We've been saved by grace. God loved us just as we are in our sins. He died for us. He loved you as you were, but he never had any intention of leaving you as you were. Never, never, never. God doesn't save you to keep you the same. He saves us to change us, to make us like himself. And therefore, since the goal is for him to recreate us and make us like himself, the first step is going to be getting rid of the old stuff. So I want to ask you some questions. We're going to be intensely in your, this is an in your business message. It's in your business. Yes, it is intentionally In your business, I want you to understand that you're saved and God, in saving you, the first thing he did was he changed your status. These are days of social media, so everybody on social media knows about status. First thing you do when you get saved is he changes your status. I go from dead spiritually to alive. That's a status change. You were dead in trespasses and sins. He changed your status. Now your status is alive. You were a sinner, old status sinner. He changed it. Now you're a saint. Before you get your act together, you're a saint. He makes you that positionally. Positionally, I am a saint. Possessionally, I have to learn how to drop off the old sinner stuff. Come on, somebody. You can still, I know you saved, know you've been in church a lot of years. You can still act like quite the sinner. Oh, see, there there y'all go. There y'all go. I know what you're talking about. Yes, you know what I'm talking about. You have had sinful moments, sinful episodes. And so what we're trying to do is learn how to get rid of the old God's way so he can introduce into us the newness of life that he has ordained for us. So the first thing is you get your status changed. Your status is already changed. Don't let the devil condemn you and don't let hypocrite Christians condemn you. I'm saved and my status is saint before I get my act together. I thought you were saved. I am saved. He changed my status. You don't get to say whether I'm saved. The Lord said I'm his. 
He gave me the Holy Spirit. The moment you got saved, he gave you the Spirit. The Bible says the Spirit comes into your heart crying, Abba, Father, meaning he establishes a father, son, and daughter relationship between you and the Heavenly Father. I'm his kid it automatically, before I learn how to live, I'm his child. And so you got to get this straight. Status change first. Now that my status has changed, he said, all right, now we're going to go to work on your position. You're positionally alive. You're positionally a saint. Now let me work with you to teach you how to possessionally be a saint. Possess saint, saint tributes, saint attributes. And so that's what God is doing in all of us now. So this message comes to just ask you to, to look at the areas of your life where there's some stuff that needs to be put off. Are you already aware? I think I, I asked this question at the close of the last message. Let me ask it again. Are you already aware of things in your life that need to be put off? You should already be aware of some stuff because your heart should be tender enough where the Holy Spirit can convict you. I don't want that. I don't like that. That's not my plan. We're not doing that. If you've never heard any of that, You've never heard the Holy Spirit ever say, uh, 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 nope, this ain't it. If you've only heard congratulations and never conviction, something wrong with your experience. The God we serve loves you enough to correct you. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Some folk think, you know, just because you didn't do something right, that means you don't have a right relationship with God. No, no. The Bible says he loves his kids, so he chastens his kids. Who he doesn't chasten is the other folk. They're already under judgment. He's trying to get them together before judgment comes because they're already in trouble. You don't go around disciplining other people's kids, but your own. I'm talking about, I'm talking about proper parenting. I'm sorry. Proper parenting. Because I, I grew up in the days of proper parenting where they say, you my child. Don't tell me about what Jimmy and them can do. Well, over at their house, I, you, you don't live over there. Not your family. What you telling me about them? Let them do whatever it is they do over there. So you've got to learn that's the way our God is. So you should have already experienced some conviction. If you just skating the whole day, every day, all day with your nastiness, something wrong. So you ought to already be aware. But if you happen to not be aware and if you happen to have muted out the Holy Spirit's voice, another way that the Lord wants to get to you is through some truth tellers in your life. Do you have some folks who love you enough to tell you the truth? See, some of y'all only have fans. You need friends. A friend loves at all times. Some of y'all only surround yourself with your friends, with your posse, with your gang, with your clique. We roll together. No, God wants you to have some people in your inner circle who love you too much to leave you lying to yourself. You need some people who will tell you what you need to hear even when they know it's not what you want to hear. Do you have any of them? Do you have any of them in your life group? That's why we have life groups here at Destiny. That's what it's about life. We do life together. Life means when I hear you say something, I say, wait, wait, can, can I ask you about that? Tell me a little bit more about that, what you just said. Life, we're doing life together. They, they, they shouldn't just let you just say any old thing, do any old thing, have any old priority, and, and no one says anything. That's not doing life together. So... Are there truth tellers in your life, people who have permission to say things like, can I see you for a minute? And they pull you to the side because they're not trying to embarrass you in front of other people. They pull you to the side. This, this isn't an embarrassment session. And you need some folks who will tell you, you know what, when you said this, when you did this, your attitude is et cetera. They get 
down into your business. And, and you need to thank God for them. A friend loves at all times. A brother's born for adversity. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Told you many times before, you need some folk who can cut you. See, you're only familiar with the folk who cut you because they're enemies with a knife trying to stab you to death. No, you need somebody else who has something sharp, but their job is not to stab you to death. Their job is to do surgery to life. A surgeon has something sharp, but they're not your enemy. A surgeon has a sharp instrument because they're trying to cut something out of you that if it doesn't get cut out, that's what's going to kill you. So you got to have some folks who have permission to handle the scalpel. See, some of y'all, have you never met anybody. You never even considered anybody getting in your business like that. You already, you ready to buff up on somebody first chance you get. <laughs> Nobody disrespect me. I'm not disrespecting you. I'm telling you the truth. In love. I'm not disrespecting you. Your feelings are hurt because you're wrong. That's all. Your feelings are hurt when you're wrong. Don't get mad at me because you're wrong. I was offended. Apologize to me and I'll forgive you. <laughs> now we're taking care of it. I offended you by telling you the truth. Apologize to me. I'm so sorry. I was tripping, got mad at you, and all you did was told me the truth. Apologize to me. I said, oh, I'll forgive you. If it was a pastoral relationship, I'll be like a priest. My son, I forgive you. So, but you need to do that with your friends. You need to do that with your inner circle. People it don't have an inner circle of liars. Don't have an inner circle of enablers. Have an inner circle whose job is to help you get to heaven and help you get God some credit on your way. That's what your inner circle needs to be. We all going to heaven together. That means we want to tell each other the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And if you don't like it, if the cat is being rubbed wrong, let the cat turn around. Because I'm not changing the truth for you. All right, there are four areas. Four areas. I got 28 more minutes. Four areas we should examine I want to make sure that you are putting off your stuff. So I want to give you four areas to examine. First, let's look at your assets. Your assets. The stuff you have in your life. Whether it's material assets, whatever. Your body is an asset. Your material goods and possessions are assets. Your money Asset, your influence, an asset. Let's look at your assets. We belong to God. Every one of us belong to God who are saved by grace. Well, technically, even all humanity belongs to God in that, you know, if I miss you in Jesus, I'll catch you in Adam. I get that. But the fact of the matter is I'm not talking about you as a human being being a child of God by creation and procreation. I'm talking about those of us who are in Christ. So we, are, we belong to God because we are in Christ. Let's establish some things in the Scriptures. Psalm 100, verse 3, you already know it. Know ye that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. King James says, and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. He made us, we belong to him. You're his child. Go to 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. Do you not know that your bodies, one of your assets, are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You, watch this, are not your own. It's my body. No, it's not. It's his body. He's letting you live in. Verse 20, you were bought at a price. 
Therefore, honor God with your body. Nobody tells me what to do. God does. God does. He gets to tell you what to do with your body. That's why he's, you'll read your Bible and you come across a cor- uh, fornication, adultery, and lasciviousness and all this. He, he gets to tell you that's not what I made you to do. Amen. He gets to tell you stop it because yeah. it's his body that you're living in. You just saw it right in the word. Don't get mad at me. You, I didn't write it. <laughs> why you get mad at the mailman? All he did was drop something off. He wasn't the author. So every asset we have belongs to God. Not only our bodies, not only our material possessions, your what three major assets you have are your time, your talent, and your treasure. Your time belongs to God. He gets to call time. One of these days he's going to call time. You're out of here. The alarm clock doesn't wake you up. Whole lot of folks alarm clock went off this morning and they laid right there. Because time got called. And so time belongs to God in your life. So the question is, what do you need to put off from your current lifestyle in the way you're misusing time? There's some things you're doing with your time that God has not endorsed. So how does he want you to use the time he gave you? So that's, those are the kinds of questions we have to consider. Look at all the hours in a given week. How many of those are you using for things that are not God's will for your life? And it's not just sinful things, not just sinful. Sometimes it's not sin, but it's unproductive and it's not God's will because you're not doing what he has told you to do. If you sub what you want to do and, and instead of what God has called you to do with some areas of your time, then those are things you've got to put off. So it's not, and it's not a matter of, well, and not everything in life is spiritual. Of course it's not. Work is necessary in most of our lives just to earn a living so that we can have a life. Some of y'all still don't get it. Earning a living is not life. You can earn a living and not have a life. God wants you to have a life, but earning a living allows you to do it. So are you earning your living in such a way that honors and glorifies God, your use of time? You, wanna, you want to glorify him. I don't work for God. I work for the man, and, and, he, and I don't like his, his policies anyway, so I just do what I want with the time. You can't do that. You're going to get fired in Jesus' name. God didn't call you, don't worry about it. Your boss not even say, don't even worry about it. Just go ahead and, and, and spend your whole time doing stuff your boss didn't tell you. To. That's not God's will. You work for Caesar, give to Caesar what belongs to him. You got to work, you, you know, you got to understand I have to honor God wherever I am. Look at Daniel, look at the three Hebrew boys. They're in Babylon, they're in heathen country. That's where they live. But they honored God even among the heathen. That's what you're called to do. Every day some of y'all get to do that. You work around a whole bunch of heathens. And God, God didn't throw it off on them. They need to get saved. No, no. How are they going to get saved and they see you? You won't even honor God by, by treating your time right. I don't want a Jesus that... Uh, that lets me flake off on somebody else's dime, that's not God's will. Ooh, Lord have mercy. (laughs) Your talent, what are you doing with the giftings God has given you to do? What are you doing? Why are you sitting on gifts God told you to use? What did he give you the gift for except to use it? Giftedness is a responsibility. It's not a privilege. It's not something to gloat about. It's not something to brag about. It's something to use for God's glory. When you have a gift, you have a responsibility. It's not something that's optional. 
God gave you the gift because he wanted a return on that investment. So you got to look at your gifts. Which of your gifts just laying around doing nothing? God said, I gave it to you for a reason. How come you're not using it for my glory? How come you're not using it to honor me, to bless the kingdom, and to help people in, in, in life, wherever they are, however you can help them? So you got to look at your assets and, of course, your treasure, your talent, and, uh, and, and, I mean, and your treasure. I'll talk about uh, th there's a um, stewardship message coming up, one of the series I'll do later in the year. we got to deal with stewardship. You can't, you can't ignore the fact that the Bible talks about money more than talks about most things because God cares how you use the, the assets he places in your hand. Read Matthew 25 when you get a chance. It matters to God. He gave you some talents, some treasures, and he goes away and he says, I'm coming back and you got to give an account for it. And so you've got to look at your assets. This week I want you to look at your assets and find out what needs to be put off of the way you're using your assets, your body, the way you're using your time, your talent, your treasure, how are you not fulfilling God's plan and you need to put some stuff off? Number two, number two is your associations. Your associations, that is your relationships, your dealings with people, however personal, however technical the relationship is, whether it's a casual relationship or a professional relationship or a personal relationship, a spiritual, spiritually based relationship, whatever it is. Let's look at your associations. Since you belong to God, the relationships, the associations in your life matter to God. Again, he's our parent. Parents care where the kids are going and who they're going with and why. Yo, come on, some of y'all... Have you ever heard, okay, maybe you were parented where you could just walk out the, out the door any old time, come back whenever you felt like it. But some of us in this room, some of us online can tell you if you lived in their house, they want to know where are you going, why, who you going to be with, when are you coming back. Somebody brought up the phone. They just had a flashback. Who was that on the phone? Oh, come on, come on. I'm talking about it mattered. Good old-fashioned parents, it mattered to them. Don't worry about it. You didn't say that back in my day. Don't worry. Wait, what? <laughs> Did you just take quick leave of your senses? You just had a brain... Wait, what? Don't worry about it. In our day, you couldn't just bring stuff in the house. What's in that bag? Don't worry about it. What's in that box? Don't worry about it. That's why when you say, when I see these stories on, online, these minors coming to school with, with arsenals, where did you store an arsenal? Back in my day, there was no box coming in my daddy's house, and he didn't say, what's that? Don't worry about it. You kidding? Come on, baby boomers. Our fathers would have... They would, if, 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 they, if we had a, a, a box and, and he asked what it was, we said, don't worry about it, he'd have probably cocked his head to the side... Because he's trying to figure out. <laughs> what just happened with this child? So, so you, you got to understand. And, and God cares who you're dealing with. He does. It's all through your Bible. He cares who you're dealing with. 
You see Proverbs all up and down telling you about who to deal with, who not to deal with. You see those classic things throughout your scripture. Even when somebody used to be good for you, if they change, if they become toxic, you need to know this is no longer a healthy relationship. I don't care that it used to be good. Some relationships used to be good. Now they're not and they have to change. You have to put off stuff that has become toxic as you deal with other people. You can't just let them hang out in your life um, to your own demise. You have got to, let them know, well, where's your Bible? 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Bad company corrupts good character. Bad company, not bad people. Sometimes the people, oh, but he all right, but his company's bad. I'm not going, in other words, I'm not going to argue with you about, um, um, you know, are they a good person? If their company, if hanging around you doesn't produce good things in your life, they're bad company. Yes, do, you, do you know good, quote, unquote, good people can be bad company? Because they're wasting your time. They're taking you in another focus you shouldn't have. Amen. And so the Bible said bad company corrupts good character. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 16. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. When I grew up, they were always talking about getting who you got married to. It didn't say anything about marriage. Oh, it's going to in include that, but the principle is yoking your life with somebody who isn't going where God's taking you. Why are you in a yoke? A double yoke, two oxen, they both have yokes, so they're tied by their yoke. And they got to go in the same direction because they're bound. Amen. Everybody get it? Yes. Don't be in the yoke with folk who don't love God and are walking with him. But I know Christians who got married and they weren't saved. I do too. I passed a whole bunch of them. The Bible doesn't tell you to go back, try to undo your, you, you can't undo that stuff. You married, uh, you know, both of y'all were, were not in Christ or one of you came into Christ, the other uh, is not. The Bible didn't say break that up because y'all not, uh, not equally yoked. No, you got to figure out how to live with that person. In fact, the scriptures tell you there's a way that you live in such a way that you witness to them by the way you operate as a spouse. Oh, this is some good teaching. You don't like it, but it's good. I brought my own amens. Go on, Doc. Come on up, Doc. So you sit there and have all kind of faces. I'm not scared of your face. Got a mask on anyway. I can't see the face you're making. <laughs> but, but later on, one of these days, if we ever get out of these masks and you go to making those bad faces, I've seen many a bad face over my years. I've seen intimidating, I've seen mad folk. I've seen all kinds of, you see what, what you see up here. It's, it's something. <laughs> Sometimes you will stop my message and say, really? <laughs> That's the way you want to look at me, really. But nobody's scared of you. <laughs> Isn't that what we say to this kid? Ain't nobody scared of you. Do not be yoked together in a covenant relationship with somebody who is an unbeliever. That's the general rule. Yes, there are, yeah, there are exceptions to the principle, but the principle is if you have the opportunity to make the call now, don't start out in a relationship that is with somebody who is going in a different direction because they have a different set of priorities. Then look at, look at the common sense here in 1 Corinthians 6. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? It's just common sense. It's not, yeah, you go judging people. I'm not judging people. I'm trying to live righteous. You're trying to be as wretched as you possibly can. <laughs> what are we going to have in common? You are excelling in wretchosity. I know that's not a word. I just made it up. 
What fellowship can light have with darkness? You see that? Darkness is not being judged by light. It just exposes what was in the dark. That's all. Next question. What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? That's a name, that, that's an ancient name of a presence of evil. Other, other religions have it, whatever represented evil in theirs. We know, we know the evil one in the word of God. His name is Satan. And what relation, what harmony is there between him and Christ? It's, see, it's just common sense. Why, why are you telling me who I can be with? The Bible's telling you, what's the point of trying to walk with somebody who's not going where you're going? Amen. Last question in the, in the text. What does a believer have in common with, the other, other, with an unbeliever? Oh, and the next verse, verse 16, asks the final question. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? In other words, look at the contrast that just your life goals create. Your life priorities create, uh, uh, um, they create contrasts that you have nothing to do with. I'm going east, you're going west. At a certain point, we could, we could stop and have a little quick conversation. But as soon as we keep going where we're going, we're part and company. You get it? So you can't have a flat-out yoke-bearing relationship and it work well. That's the whole thing he's trying to say here. So I know somebody who got saved and, and they were saved and they married an unbeliever. Yeah. So that doesn't make it right. And now that they're married with them, they need to, they need to dwell with them according to knowledge. Bible doesn't tell them break up with your unsaved spouse. Some folk want to break up more with their saved one than their unsaved one. <laughs> Truth be told, and we tell them, nope, nope, you made that, you stay there. Oh, I got more people trying to get me to justify their mess. No, I'm a preacher of the word of God. I can't give you what you want. Pastor, what should I do? Stay there. You married them to death, not till frustration. And by the way, you know, you can't kill them. The prophet Amos, the Old Testament, you know that, Amos 3 and 3, how can two walk together? Lest they be agreed. NIV says, do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? You got to reach an agreement. You want to go here? I want to go here. Want to go together? Yeah. Let's go. That's agreement. Let's go. We go together. We talk with each other. We, fe we fellowship while we're going. And you can't do that unless there's agreement. All right? I got to move along. So the key question, not only is how are you handling your assets, now you got to look at how are you handling your association. Do you have relationships that even God can't touch? I'm not letting God get at this. God's not, God's not going to tell me about my entanglement. The third part, oh, no, I'm not, I'm just leaving that with you. <laughs> just let that marinate. That's what that's going to do. That's just going to marinate right there. <laughs> just right there. You and your entanglement, you got to answer to God. We got a, we got a, we got a situation ship. I've heard that one too. Oh, when you're a pastor, you hear everything. You know, I have a kind of situation ship. Okay. <laughs> so, assets, association. Number three, your actions, which include your words. What's the Bible say about them? Colossians 3.17, the, Old Te the New Testament book of Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, that's why I added words to it. 
whether in word or deeds, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So are your actions and all your words things that you can give glory to God as you speak and as you do? And are there things you say, no, no, I, I can't say God's pleased with that. Then that's in the putting off category. Plain and simple. It's in the putting off category. It said whatever you do. It's not like you, well, I didn't do it around the saints. What that got to do with anything? I didn't offend anybody because nobody saw me. Do you know you have a God who's watching, who's with you every day, who knows when you are sleeping? He knows when you are awake. <laughs> he knows when you're good or bad. See, what they used to tell us was Santa Claus, that wasn't Santa Claus, that was the Lord. They messed around and put that on some, some fat dude from up north. <laughs> that wasn't him, that was the Lord. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. What does it mean to, to act or speak in his name? It, on his authority, things he would be pleased with in compliance with him is what that means. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. So the key question here is, are you speaking and acting in ways that please God, plain and simple? And you got to evaluate that. Ooh, life groups are going to have fun with this week's outline. <laughs> Number four and finally, attitudes. God's not just coming for your assets, your associations, your actions and words. He's looking at your attitude. 1 Samuel 16, 7. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Here's another get in your business scripture in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. I love that. Paul said, don't judge stuff that you see now. You don't have the equipment to judge it with. That's in your life and in other people's lives. You ever seen these condemning Christians condemning other folk? You don't know what's in their heart. You don't know how they're dealing with God and how God is dealing with them. The time is coming, though, when God will bring to light the things that are hidden in darkness. It either happened in this life or in judgment. And what will he expose? The motives. Of the heart. Do you know the difference between Saul and David was one thing, heart? A lot of people look at Saul being dethroned by God and saying, yeah, he stole sheep. He kept some folk alive. God said to kill and he stole sheep and cattle and God said to kill them all. But, uh-uh. And David, a murderer and adulterer. So in your world, David's done. Paul Give him a slap on the wrist. Saul, slap on the wrist and let him go on about his business. No, God said just the opposite because I'm looking at the heart. When Saul was told by Samuel, God said, kill all of the Amalekites. Er, er, last one of them. God said, kill them all. Old Testament, cold-blooded. God, in, in the Old Testament, the only way you get rid of sin is get rid of sinners. Y'all better thank God you live in the New Testament. <laughs> We'd have been a bunch of dead. <laughs> Kill them all. 
Don't keep any of them alive. Kill the livestock, God, God, livestock. God said, I'll, I'll raise up my own cattle. My, I got my own stash. You kill every last one of them heathen cows. God was serious. What happened? He kept most of them, he killed most of them, kept some alive. When he saw something good, he said, ooh, keep that. So when God sent Samuel back to him, Samuel said, did you do what the Lord? Well, first of all, it's, it's, it's almost comical. In uh, 1 Samuel 15, read it when you get a chance. It's almost comical. He sees Samuel, the prophet of God, coming down the road. Praise the Lord. You ever seen folk try to block their wrongdoing with spiritual stuff? Folk do it every week at church. Praise the Lord. If you know him real good, say, what did you do? <laughs> Don't give me praise the Lord. What did you do? And Samuel said, did you do what the Lord told you? Here's the heart. Saul said, yeah. Did exactly what the Lord said. That showed his heart. He's about image, not about substance. Samuel said, then how come I hear sheep? Right there in 1 Samuel 15. Read it. How come I, I hear the lowing of cattle? Cows? What, what? You didn't do what the Lord said because I would put my ear to the wind and hear nothing if you did what the Lord said. Oh, it's showing his heart. My army... They kept some stuff alive. Shows your heart. You who can't own stuff, something's wrong with your heart. David, on the other hand, yes, he committed adultery, went out on the roof late at night while his army's out there fighting. He would normally be out there with them. He said, I got seniority. I'm going to let them go. Got out there on the roof, Bathsheba out there bathing. The Lord was his shepherd. He saw what he wanted. <laughs> Called her, you know the story. Called her to the palace. She got pregnant. Her husband is fighting his battle. He said, well, I got to fix this. Calls him home on a weekend of R&R. &R. So he'll go in and be with his wife so he can blame the pregnancy on her when he finds out he's pregnant. He's such a soldier, he won't sleep with his wife. He said, my boy's out there dying. He wouldn't lay in the bed with his wife out of loyalty to a king that's, that has gotten into an entanglement. Sends wine over. He get drunk. He forget all this soldier stuff. He got, he, he took a little wine, but he still wouldn't lay with his way. He said, I'm not going to do that. My boy's out here dying. David now gets desperate. It's time for him to go back to the battlefield. He sends him with sealed orders for his own death. And he's such a soldier, he won't open the sealed orders. Hands them off. And his boys look at it. And it's told, put him at the front of the battle then withdraw from him. How cold. See, that's what, that's what some of y'all, I don't believe. <laughs> yeah, cold. Yeah, callous. Yeah, this, that, the other. But when God sent Nathan to David in 2 Samuel 12, see, he does all this in 2 Samuel 11 when he sends his prophet in 2 Samuel 12, Prophet tells this story, and David gets mad because the story sounds like somebody else. <laughs> Isn't that like us? They did what? <laughs> but Nathan's a man of God. He said, you're the man. Here's what the Lord says, and he rebuked him for his sin. What was David's response? I have sinned. He went low. 
he owned. He said, I have sinned against the Lord my God. It showed his heart. You don't need a perfect person. You need a person whose heart can be broken. And because of that, God said, I'm not going to take the throne from you. There's going to be consequences. You caused this, and there's going to be consequences. Sin always has consequences. But consequences aren't to death when you own them and put them under the blood. So you've got to understand God loves a brokenhearted person. He cannot deal with hard-hearted, throwing off the blame on other people, people. Amen. Amen. That's it. Let's stand. You need to get into a life group this week so that you can unpack this stuff with some folks. Let's stand and get ready to commune. If you don't have a communion set with you, then um, raise your hand until one of the ushers spots your hand and they'll give you a communion set. Keep your hand up until that happens. I brought with me a hymn book because modern Christians think praise and worship has been the order today. I grew up on this. Hymnal of the Church of God. They later, they later came out with a second one that was red. This one's like more maroon. When they came out with the red one and we looked at some of the verses, they had changed a few of the words, a little more user-friendly language in some of them. And I said, that's not that. When that red one came out, I said, that's not the hymn book. I grew up, I was a pew baby. The saints were singing out of this one. And at this time of communion, somebody would say, let's turn in our hymnals to 304. <laughs> and here's what it is. Alas, and did my... Come on, some of y'all know it. And did, and did my sovereign Would he such come on at the cross everybody at the cross where I first and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there I received my sight and I am happy. Second verse, was it for crime? Was it that I had done? He groaned upon the amazing grace unknown and love. Come on, sing the chorus. At the cross, oh, at the cross, where I first am the burden rolled away. It was there that I received. Now I'm happy. One more verse, but drops of grief but can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself. Tis all that I can do. Everybody at the cross, oh, at the cross, where I first and the burden 
rolled away It was there by faith I received And now I am Now, the only difference is when I sang that as a boy in the 60s, I was born in 57, so I'm a pew baby in the 60s. When the saints sang 304, there was no drums. They didn't do drums. There was no bass. There was, they didn't do bass. God had put an organ and piano only in the church. But over in the 70s, some of us young people, now teenagers, start getting saved. And we wanted to sing, Oh, Happy Day, and Andre Crouch. And we went to the church. The pastor, who was fortunately a, a, a man who was a world-class man, my father, and we said, we want to sing some of this new gospel song. And he said, all right, I'll let y'all sing those on you Sunday for a special before the message. But first, you're going to sing the hymns. We sang out that book in the 70s as teenagers because saints said you're not going to get to sing your stuff till you sing the old fashioned stuff and then one of the people who got one of the young people that got saved was a drummer they said well can he play and then one of the boys that got saved played congas said, can he play and they said alright and they started playing That's, we brought the, the instruments in in the 70s because we were getting saved and we asked the old folk could we ask the pastor could we do it and he said sure because he knew he was wise enough to know if I don't let them bring the instruments in here Amen. there are places they will play Amen. and so he let us do it he told the saints the old saints going to be drums my grandmother his mother died at 100 years old in the 80s so she saw the drums and she had a place where she sat she wasn't far from them she was a little concerned <laughs> but at the close of the service she went over to the drummer she said you know young man when my pastor told me that drums were coming I, I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about that but he's the pastor and so I was going to support it she said, but I have to admit, while I sat here, I found myself patting my foot while you were playing the drums. That's my paternal grandmother. Found myself patting. She said, I actually enjoyed it. Then she used old people psychology. She said, what I like is that you don't play them too loud. <laughs> she was letting him know this was fine, but don't turn it up. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and broke it, gave to his disciples, said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Let us eat it. And then the Lord Jesus took bread, took the cup, rather, and gave to each of them said, this, this fruit of the vine is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let us drink it today as we remember his sacrifice for us. Amen. Glory to God. At the cross, where I first, and the burden rolled away. It was there I received And now One more time at the cross Where I first And the burden It was there Prayer team, come on down. If you're going to pray with, be ready to pray with people. My son, and now all the glory to God. Glory to God. Any prayer team members who are ready to pray with someone, just come on down right now. Listen, if this 
message has stirred something in you, you need to pray, or there's just something going on in your life in general, even if it's not related to the message, but you need some prayer support. All of us need to take advantage of the power that is in the agreement of prayer. And if you need to pray with someone, these folks are available who are standing in the front. If they're tied up, just give them a moment to pray with someone else, and they'll get to you there after. Online, go into our prayer lobby and do the same thing. Listen, if anybody's been in this service online or in person and you need the Lord, we want to pray with you to receive him. So be sure to pray with someone and say, I need to give the Lord my, my life to the Lord. We'll pray with you, and we'll get some information with you so we can follow up. Thanks for being with us. Have a safe and sane 4th of July. Safe and sane. Father, as we go, we pray that you bless us and make us a blessing in Jesus' name.